So this is AMD's Ryzen 7000. We're going to calculate how much it costs AMD to manufacture one of these chips. What's your minimum specification? Well shucks, the cloud is here, but which cloud do you trust? Manage your infrastructure with Linode, the biggest independent cloud services provider. Linode offers double the database performance per dollar than the big four, and now enhances it further with new NVMe backed block storage. Spin up a game server, website, personal VPN, or something more bespoke today with a free $100 60 day credit at linode.com slash techdeppotato. By now, you should have seen what AMD's next generation Ryzen 7000 processor looks like, because it's a couple of chiplets and an I.O. die, much like the previous generation. This time, however, those core chiplets are based on TSMC's 5nm HPC process, that's updated from 7nm, and the I.O. die is on TSMC's 6nm, updated from Global Foundry's uh, 12 and 14. I've made a couple of videos on what the announcements of seven, Ryzen 7000 have been, along with a video review of the chips, but it's this deleted version of the chip to show what's underneath that I'm going to tackle today. So as part of the event where AMD discussed the finer details of this chip, all of which was under embargo when we had it, the die size of each of those chiplets is also uncovered under that same non-disclosure agreement. However, AMD at the time, and now since that we have the chips in for review, they've decided to publish the die sizes on their website for all to see. If you navigate to the page of the Ryzen 9 7950X, the new 16-core Halo part, and click the technical specifications, it showcases two numbers. The CPU compute die, or CCD, is 71mm squared, and the IO die, or IOD, is 122mm squared. These are accurate to the nearest square millimeter, as we'll see in a second, given that AMD has already released high resolution photos of the chip. We can use these numbers to find the right ratios of numbers to give accurate height and width dimensions of each chip. Thankfully, someone has already done that for me. Enter Lacusa's diagram. As always with these top-down photos, it can be hard to pinpoint the exact pixel where the silicon starts and when that binding filler ends. The picture on the left was the initial predictions on one photo, and the right is the latest imagery shared at a better angle. AMD's value of 71 square millimeters is really about 70.51, and that 122 is about 122.78. The reason why I want these numbers is that we can now calculate how many silicon chips of each can be built on a 300mm wafer. We know TSMC's defect rates, so if we also add in the price per wafer, we can find the production cost per chip to AMD for this CPU. Hi everyone, Future Ian here. I realized I should probably at least talk through um, this wafer, uh, this silicon per wafer calculator. The one we commonly use, or a lot of my peers use at least, is this Kali Technologies one. However, this website is currently offline, so we're going through the Wayback Machine here. However, this interface is very straightforward. It, uh, you enter your die dimensions, as well as what, what are called scribe lanes. And then depending on the wafer diameter, edge loss, and uh, defect density, you can use Murphy's low model of die yield to see how many act to see how many dies you get from your manufacturing process given the defect rate or the d0 and when you put in numbers you get something that looks like this on the right hand side so this is a 300 millimeter wafer as we see on the left hand side uh, we've got a defect density of 0 0.1 per square centimeters and what we have in the center is what is a wafer and all the die that are full complete in the design are labeled in green. And where we have a defect, which could indicate a bad die, we essentially have this grayed out. The ones along the edge that may not be complete are in um, are in this yellow. So at the top here, we can see what, is, what are the number of good dies, what are the number of partial dies, defective dies, and wasted dies. And normally this fab yield percentage is when we take the the uh, good dies plus partial dies, so that's the maximum number of dies per wafer without defect, and it's the portion of good dies into that defect metric. So, what are some of the uh, some of the numbers here? Well, let's go back to the left, and we have simple die width and die height. So, if I make this twenty millimeters, for example, and click off this, uh, this picture here will adjust appropriately as and when the numbers uh, change. So as you can see, I just doubled uh, doubled the width, and we now have uh, rectangular-shaped silicon dies. 
And the yield has gone down from 90% to 82%. And that's simply a function of the fact that smaller dyes tend to have higher yields. So let's go back down to the uh, 10, 10 by 10 millimeters. So 100 square millimeters, that's a standard smartphone die. And it's slightly bigger than, say, an AMD Zen 4 core die. Now next, we have what are called scribe lanes, listed in millimeters. We have horizontal and vertical. The scribe lane is essentially the distance between die when you manufacture. So you have to have a, a little bit of leeway between two consecutive pieces of silicon that you're going to cut later in order for your saw to essentially go down that line. So right now we have 0.2 millimeter, 0.2 millimeter. And if we increase this, then we again get slightly different numbers as it changes. 0.2 is perhaps a good amount here for a 300 millimeter wafer. Next, we have the edge loss. And the edge loss is the difference between this red circle, which is your full 300 millimeter wafer, and this green circle, which is, say, five millimeters currently inside. Now, your edge loss is essentially saying, look, these silicon dyes around the edge may not be perfect. There may be some other physical issues as a result of the manufacturing just because these are on the edge of the wafer. And this is very plausible. I mean, we could literally go down to a zero millimeter edge loss. And, you know, the, the fab yield is roughly the same. And if we just bring it back, yeah, it's the same going from five millimeters here um, to, to zero, to 0 0.2. Um, in this data, we're using a value of four, and it, it gives that nice mix. Now, next here is defect density. Uh, so foundries will try their best to minimize the amount of physical defects. This is D0 or defect density. These are defects occurred in the physical production. So we're talking about uh, misaligned routing or bad physically bad transistors. This is nothing to do with frequency and voltage. That's a different sort of testing. This is purely in terms of the physical manufacturing. Now, we don't have many details of a lot of process nodes in terms of their defect density. However, TSMC have stated that their 7 nanometer 6 nanometer and 5 nanometer is at least 0 0.07 per square centimeter. And when we change this from 0.1 to 0 0.07, we see that the yield goes up to 93% because we now have fewer defects. And then if we went up to, say, 2 per square centimeter, then you can see you know, just the stochastic noise of where the defects may be. So you may get one defect. In one die, you may get two defects in a die, you may get zero defects in a die. Really, when a foundry process is trying to be optimized, you want this defect density to be as low as possible. And uh, then we have a wafer placement. So as you can imagine, just simply having a grid of die isn't always in the best location. So the mask will be offset to essentially maximize how many uh, how many of these squares can actually be produced at any one time. This, uh, this calculator automatically centers it based on the size of, uh, of, of your chip that you've selected, though you can manually adjust it. So we can, say, change this to 5 millimeters, and it will move, it will move them along, and some of these numbers will change. But you know, it's good to leave these by themselves. This wafer calculator is great because you can put in the size of your favorite chip so let's say, let's do something more sort of reticle limited, uh, which is say a 40 by 20. And then without changing anything else, with the same defect rate, you only have a fab yield, that's a D0 yield, of 58.63%. So if you suddenly have a lot more or defects, you suddenly have very few good die. This is why it's important when you uh, build large chips to use a process node which has very few defects. But it also showcases the benefits of simply doing the chiplet design. So if, if we do something small, as we tend towards, say, 5 by 5 millimeter chiplets, then we're looking at, say, 98% yield for the, for the same metrics here. And then these will be, be binned for voltage and frequency performance. 
And the idea is that if you have a multi-chiplet design, you can put the best performing chips of, say, this type next to the best performing chips of another type. And your frequency distribution of your product can actually go up. And uh, companies will productize that in, in terms of different SKUs, just like um, Intel currently does uh, with, with their core processors and the KS, and then AMD also with the Ryzen 9, Ryzen 7, Ryzen 5. Not only can you have differences in the core count and the defects, but you can also have differences just in simply binning a voltage frequency. So that's a brief overview of, uh, of this uh, die, per, die per wafer or die yield calculator. And uh, it's a real shame that this website is currently undergoing maintenance because it really is the best one out there. Thank you. So let's start with the core die. We need the width and the length of the silicon because the aspect ratio has an effect on these calculations. But with reasonable scribe lines and edge loss, at TSMC's advertised defect rate of 0.07 per square centimeter per 5 nanometer, we get a yield of about 95.2%, or 798 non-defect chips per wafer. At this point, we're going to assume that all the non-defect chips meet the minimum voltage frequency voltage requirements, to be used in a product. Given AMD's advertised frequency and efficiency numbers, I'm sure even the worst defect-free chip could do 3 GHz at reasonable power. This is typically what we call D0, just the defect, and we're assuming 100% yield post the defect uh, calculation. So now we come to the cost of the wafer. Now, as has been reported, TSMC's 5 nanometer is sold at a premium, especially when it's used for high-performance computing. Estimates vary wildly, but asking industry analysts for at least a ballpark, about $17,000 per wafer sounded reasonable. At this cost of wafer, we're looking at just over $20 per die. Two of them, so that's $40. Now we pivot to the IO die, and we run through the same process. Using the calculator with the width and length, we put in reasonable scribe lines and edge loss, and the defect rate for TSMC 6 nanometer which is quoted at roughly the same as 5 or 7 nanometer these days, and we get a yield of 91.8% or 437 non-defect chips for wafer. The reason why this yield is lower is simply because the chip is bigger. If we instead talk about having 80 defects per wafer, then you could have 160 chips, that would be an effective yield of 50%. But this is more about the reason why chiplets are the future of high-performance computing. So now we have the number of known good die per wafer, which again just leaves the cost of the wafer. I spoke to again a few peers, and they gravitated more around the $10,000 number for TSMC 6 nanometer. Some of those estimates were higher, some were lower, so I'm taking what is a good estimate mean. At that cost per wafer, we're looking at around $21 per IO die. So how much does the silicon cost in a Ryzen 9 7950X? Around $60. But that's not including the packaging. Packaging is also quite expensive these days, as many of the companies have listed packaging and substrates as some of their limiting factors during the chip shortage. From our estimates, that means it's going to be just under $10, and that means that your new shiny CPU costs around $69 to make. Nice. Disclaimer, as with all napkin math videos like this, every value has a margin of error, and I know some people aren't keen on these layered assumptions, but without better data, it's hard to zoom in more to these numbers. This video isn't meant to be the definitive answer to AMD's bill of material costs, but it's at least a fun exercise to get somewhere around ballpark. You got any thoughts? Well, there's a comment section below, and we'll see if anyone comments something other than nice.